you decide to see the rest. Yeah, I was speaking with my, whatever night that was, was Russ as well. Oh, yeah. And he took, uh, took every number I had. Yeah, now they were uh, doing some pretty thorough interviews that night. So. Yeah, absolutely. It was All great. Right. Glad to see you. I'm um, just going to move your gloves here. That's a little microphone just okay. to make sure there's nice and clear. Um, as you can see here, everything in this room is uh, videotaped and audio taped. Check. Uh, just want to clarify something. We've only watched one video on this case, haven't we? Yeah, and that's the JCS. Yeah, watch the JCS video. The rest is just purely internet research, isn't it, that we've done? It is, yeah. So, um, yeah, it is very significant, and we agree with JCS on, you know, the fact that he called him Russ instead of addressing him by his proper title, Colonel, Colonel Williams, or whatever, sir. Yeah. Because um, that's what he's used to being addressed as, isn't it? Yeah, and I also don't think he's um, used to... Uh authority people calling him russ probably well probably not no um i mean jim smith jim smith jim smith i think his name's jim smith would be several ranks below him um you know because williams is a full bird colonel so um yeah that is but it doesn't seem to phase him it it doesn't seem to phase Russell Williams whatsoever that he's not been addressed by his, you know, standard greeting or standard title. Well, no, I mean, he's looking cool, calm and collected and... Inside he's, inside, he's bricking it. He is bricking it inside, trust me. Yeah. He's got to be, hasn't he? Well, he's wondering, do they really have all this? Well, I don't think... I think he's smart enough to know that if they didn't have anything, they wouldn't be calling him in. Yeah, but then again, why the hell would he wear the same boots he had on? <laughs> this is it. When you, you know, I mean, he graduated to murder. He was starting to kind of get a bit more confident. I think he got a bit too confident. Yeah, and he, start, and he left uh, certain clues. He should have burned those those boots and he should have completely got rid of or changed the tires on the car exactly he should have left nothing to chance but like i said probably overconfident yep you ever been interviewed by the police in a in a room like this before i have never been interviewed like this oh no okay no let's get this set up here well, i guess the closest to interviewed by NIS for top secret clearance. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, again, Russell, I appreciate you coming in uh, an investigation like this. I mean, I'm sure you can appreciate it's been big news, uh, especially yeah. down uh, Belleville Way. Um, and, you know, obviously our approach to cases like this is that uh, uh, we don't give up on somebody being alive until mm -hmm. we get evidence that they're not. So. Um, because of that, we're treating uh, Jessica's case uh, as an emergent situation, obviously. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're fast-forwarding things that we might normally take our time with. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why uh, we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, sure. So, uh, again, I appreciate it. No um, we're going to do a pretty thorough interview today. Okay. okay? Um, and the reason for that is because... Uh, the last thing we want is to be calling people back again and again and again, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go over a number of things, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to explain what all those are to you, okay? okay? Um, right, do you think he knows he's caught right now? He m might be able to uh, think he can talk his way out of it. He just needs to hope that the uh, detective doesn't ask him to speak for a shoe print because right now the way that it's being conducted it's more like a job interview isn't it than a police interview and his little you know affirmative grunts between everything that you know jim smith's saying or yeah. staff sergeant smith is saying i should say <laughs> um it sounds more like a job interview it doesn't sound as though you know that they're explaining to him they're investigating a murder case and i think that's how like you say i think he he kind of thinks he can talk his way out of it, but he just he just folds like a bloody accordion, doesn't he, at the Either end? Either that, or it's a strategy on the detective's part. You know, yeah. like ca kind of getting Williams comfortable to get him to drop his guard. Yeah, but 
you've just got to wonder how much he is panicking. I mean, he is panicking inside, you, as we've said, but oh. you've got to wonder how much he is panicking. Now, does he know he is caught? And why the hell is he not in there with a lawyer? Yeah, I mean, wouldn't that be the first thing you would do be the if you first were asked thing, to go in for questioning? Especially if you are a colonel. The first thing you do is get legal representation. If you are a high-ranking member of the military... I mean, politicians do it, sports people do it, entertainment people do it, you know, celebrities. If there's the slightest hint of any impropriety, the first thing they do is get on the phone to their lawyers. Why the hell didn't he? Because, again, he could talk his way out of it because he's a colonel. Once again, it could be that he was cocky and thought, yeah, I'm a colonel, I can schmooze my way out of this. But I don't think he had any friends after this, did he? Uh, I think everyone who we knew turned against him. They, they may have been brothers in arms, but there are limits. Aren't yeah, there? especially when it comes to murder. Yeah. I'm a big coffee guy. I don't know if you're a, a coffee guy or not, I, but I didn't guy. want to drink yeah. in front of you. So. No, I appreciate um, that. All right, go ahead. I could uh, definitely, are they black? Yeah, they're just black with uh, with sugar. Um, definitely, uh, just probably have a little bit. Sorry, you what, sorry? Gum. Just oh, okay. piece, piece of gum. <laughs> well, there's napkins there if you want to toss it or whatever. I appreciate that. All right. And again, um, like I said, this interview is going to be very thorough. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, uh, I have a simple rule when I talk to people. It's uh, I'm sure you're the same way. I, I treat pe- everybody with respect. I don't yeah. know why I ask you to do the same for me. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off by uh, going through um, what your rights are, okay? okay? Just like everybody else, okay? okay. Um, have you ever been read your rights before? No. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you've seen it on TV a whole bunch of times, right. but that's usually the American version. So okay. I'll go over with you briefly, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, basically in Canada, uh, as you know, I'm sure, is uh, we all have uh, our rights guaranteed under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, right. okay? Now, uh, Russell, just to avoid any confusion, because people do get confused when they're talked to by the police, mm-hmm. is that uh, um, you're obviously not under arrest here today, okay? Yep. Anytime you feel uh, you want to leave here, you feel free to do so. The door's not locked. Teresa will walk you down the lobby anytime you want, okay? Um, so we've just zoomed in here for two reasons. Firstly, where, where have we heard that before? Yeah, I remember. The Chris Watts yeah, case. Exactly. Coda said the same thing to Chris Watts while positioning himself between him and the door. Now, JCS also brings this up in the video. I wanted to acknowledge that he also brings this up. But when I saw that, it was kind of more when I saw the position in the top right before JCS said it, I thought, yep, yeah, Chris Watts, same thing. Yeah. Psychological. So, yeah, very, very clever on the part of Staff Sergeant Smith. He knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Oh, of course he does. I mean, he knows exactly what he's doing and he knows exactly he's got him right where he wants him. Yeah. Doesn't take long for this to all fall down for him, does it, for for (laughs) Williams? It doesn't. If there's anything that comes up in our interview today, Russell, that that you feel you want to talk uh, to a lawyer about... Sure. Um, you just uh, you just let me know, okay? Sure. And the reason for that is I want to explain to you exactly what's going on here, okay? Um, uh, Jessica uh, Lloyd is um, is one of uh, four cases that we're currently investigating, okay? Right. Um, and essentially, what's happened is over the past uh, uh, about four or five months, yeah. um, there have been four occurrences that, like I said, that we're looking into. Mm. Uh, two of those occurrences occurred in September of 2009, yeah. um, and very briefly, they were up in the uh, the Tweed area. Yeah. Uh, they involved uh, somebody entering uh, two different women's houses mm-hmm. um, in the evening hours and uh, committing uh, sexual acts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in uh, November of 2009, yeah. uh, a young lady by the name of uh, Marie France uh, Como, um, um, yeah. yeah, was found uh, murdered in her home in Brighton. Yeah. And uh, we believe that there was a sexual uh, component to that crime as well. Okay. And um, then, most recently, we have Jessica Lloyd's disappearance. Mm-hmm. Okay. So essentially, when you're looking at those kind of crimes, we're looking at a number of different uh, potential criminal charges. All right. I'm sorry. Just been talking off mic about this, haven't we? Yeah, we have. Um, we, we're pretty sure from just kind of analysing the case, from analysing him. That he was trying to see how hard, how far he could push himself, aren't we? Yeah, like um, how much more depraved he could get. Yeah, essentially. So, 
you know, breaking into women's houses when they weren't there, that turned him on. Dressing up in their underwear, especially the children's underwear, turned him on. Taking pictures turned him on. Taking them as trophies Leaving turned messages him on. turned Leaving him on. Leaving messages turned him on. And then when he graduated to, you know, sexual assault with Jane Doe and uh, with Laurie, he found that that turned him on as well. So then he moved on to Marie France Como, found that not just sexual assault, but torture and eventually murder. You know, he mustn't have felt any remorse. He must have felt some sort of gratification in order to even consider doing it to Jessica. Of course he did. That's why he did it. So if he hadn't have been caught for Jessica's murder, his next murder, how much farther would he have pushed himself, you know? Yeah, and how many more women would have died? Yeah, and in what way, how much more, you know, gruesome would he take it? It's... It's just interesting to speculate and very, very good to know that he's off the streets, isn't it? Yeah, but it's scary to think of what could have happened. Yes, very scary. Um, we're looking at issues uh, all the way from the most serious one, which is first-degree murder, mm-hmm. uh, kidnapping, uh, sexual assault, mm-hmm. um, break and enter with intent to commit sexual assault, yeah. um, forcible confinement, okay? And uh, so what I want to make sure you understand, and this is what we've been doing with everybody we've been talking to, is that Clearly, when we find out who's responsible for one or all of those crimes, uh, they could be charged with one or all of those offenses, okay? Whether it's you or whether it's anybody else, right? And that's why it's important that we uh, make sure that people understand what they have to do and what they don't have to do when they're talking to us, Mm -hmm. okay? So as I said before, any point today uh, you feel the need, you want to speak to a lawyer, uh, you let me know, and uh, we can take you to a room where you can do that in private, okay? Okay. Um, Do you have your own lawyer? I have a realty lawyer, but okay. no, I don't have a lawyer. <laughs> All right. I know I'm repeating myself here, but when he got the call from the police officers asking him to go in, why didn't he get on the phone to, like, you know, the legal department, wherever, you know, CFB Trenton or anywhere, you know, in Canadian forces and say, okay, I need a criminal lawyer. I've been accused of this. Can you send somebody? He probably thought that he wouldn't need a lawyer. Yeah, but... Just like... Chris Watts, Jody Arias. Yeah, but when you're a pilot, you take calculated risks, right? When you are um, a commanding officer, you take calculated risks. Having a lawyer present, present is a calculated risk for him. I don't know, but he's just kind of perplexes me why he hasn't even, he appears not to have even considered legal representation. Like I said, he probably didn't think he needed one at that time. Probably, yeah, but somehow I think he's smarter than that. Somehow I, I, he, he hasn't got, he didn't get to where he was without hedging his bets, somehow. You know what I mean? You, you can, he, he, can't, he couldn't have been that confident in himself, I don't think. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't know. I'm just kind of wool gathering here. I'm, I'm thinking out loud. Let us know in, your, in the comments your thoughts. Yeah, thanks. Because it, it'd be good to know kind of his thinking on this. Um, if at any point you want to make that call and you don't know who to call, mm-hmm. uh, we have a phone list of lawyers that uh, are available to give you advice free of charge right over the phone. Okay. okay? So again, if at any point today you want to uh, take advantage of that, you just let me know. Sure. Um, is there any reason you want to call a lawyer now? No. Okay. A um, couple other uh, fairly simple and straightforward uh, things that uh, you probably understand, but uh, again, we go over them to make sure everybody's clear, mm-hmm. is that uh, you don't have to speak to me today. Okay. okay. And the reason for that is because the law considers me to be what we refer to as a person in authority, mm-hmm. okay? Probably similar to what you may be considered to be on the base. Yeah. Um, and because of that, I can be compelled to appear before any judge in the country, basically, to account for what takes place here today between you and I, okay? Sure. And that's the reason why everything's recorded, yeah, um, because there can't be any more accurate record than that, right? So. No, understood. Um, right, now that's out of the way. Can we bring something up that is ultra important that many people have asked us about when they've asked us to do this case? And that's his hairline. (laughs) Now, at first, when I first saw it, I thought Fiji. It kind of looks like Fiji. But the more I think about it, it's more like Sicily, isn't it? Because no offense to Sicilians who are listening to this, but it's kind of off the landmass of his main hair. Like kind of Sicily is off the, the main 
a little bit off the mainland of of, of Italy. So kind of it kind of cro- reminds me of a cross between Fiji and Sicily. It is a weird hairdo, though, isn't it? Yeah, but then again, it also looks like a certain Fiora's moustache, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. And the other thing I want to make sure you understand is that, uh, you know, you mentioned a second ago about uh, Miss Como um, being one of your uh, work associates. Um, so I don't know what's happened since November um, on the military side of things. Um, but what we want to make people clear on is that uh, if you have been spoken to by any person in authority or any police officer about any of those cases, um, I don't want what they may have said to you to uh, um, make you feel influenced or compelled to say anything to me today, okay? Whatever you might have felt influenced or compelled to say to them earlier, mm-hmm. you don't have to repeat it to me and you don't have to say anything further, okay? okay. But obviously what you do say, you know, for the third time is being yep. recorded, right? So. Um, Understood. These first two attacks uh, happened uh, not that far from my place in Tweed. Well, the second one did. Yeah. We didn't even know the first one had happened. Bullshit. But uh, I understand that was reasonably close as well. But the second one was uh, was very close. Yeah. So certainly at the time, the OPP did a door to door. Yeah. And uh, within a couple of days, probably the same night. So I spoke with a couple guys then. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm aware of that from mm-hmm. uh, looking at the different cases. And essentially, uh, Russell, uh, in a nutshell, that's what we wanted to uh, to talk to you about. Okay, um, those four cases are of uh, concern to us, mm-hmm. and um, you know, you've kind of uh, almost hit the nail on the head about uh, some of our issues that kind of uh, make us want to talk to to Russell Williams. Okay, because mm-hmm. um, essentially, uh, there is a, a a connection um, between you and uh, and all four of those cases. Would you agree? Geographically, and then I guess or I drive past. Uh, yes, I, I would yeah. have to say there is a, a connection. Yeah. Is he really naive enough to believe that um, he's there just on geographical coincidence? I don't think so. I think this is all strategy on his part. Who Russell? Who Russell Williams is? Yeah, I think he's starting to think now that it's closing in on him. Yeah, but the only weak offering that he's got is geographical. I live near these people. You know, I drive past the houses. Yeah. Does does he really believe that that's all the police have on him? Basically, they would have to have more because if they bring someone in just because they live in that area, there's, there's they'd no have to reason bring the to the whole bleeding town in. Yeah. They'd have to bring everybody and their old and the dogs in, wouldn't they? Exactly. So he must know that they've got something else. He probably just does, doesn't know what yet. Yeah. But this guy's an enigma. Usually when we watch and we do a case, we, we kind of get a feel for him, don't we? But to me, this guy is an enigma. He's more of a... He's more of an unknown quantity to me. You can usually suss people out, but this guy's completely eluding me, I'm yeah, afraid. He's mystery. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what that's why um uh, I'll be quite frank with you, that's why uh things kind of um uh evolved when uh, the officers talked to you on Thursday night. Okay. Uh we kind of went from there because uh when I think you discussed with them the fact that you were a uh, uh, a colonel yeah. uh, at the base. Oh, I was in uniform at the time, so... Yeah, so pretty obvious, right? Yeah. Um, so essentially, uh, then the connection with Miss Como um, yeah. was made. Um, and I believe you're uh, a door or two down from one of those two uh, incidents uh, think, in Tweed. Uh, three doors down, yeah. Yeah. Very close, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So uh, those are some of the issues we wanted to discuss with you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so just getting back to uh, these four incidents that we're talking about, um, maybe you could just give me a little bit of history as to uh, your arrival in, in the uh, in the base in Trenton. When did you start working there? Friday on the day I was um, hmm. He's already got an alibi sorted out. He's just stretching this out to make it look to Detective Staff Sergeant Smith that he's, you know, having a serious think about what he did and, you know, making sure that he's eliminating any errors he may have in his mind. But he's not. He's got exactly his his explanation for what he was doing at the time. Well, it'd be stupid if he didn't. Yeah. 
he wouldn't walk in there without, you know, at least having some explanation, would he? No. Friday on the day I was at home most of the time. Most of the day I had a sort of a stomach flu. Okay. In Ottawa or Tweed? In Tweed. In Tweed? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we backtrack then. So all day Friday you're at home. Yeah. And then wh what time do you leave to go to the base to sleep there on the Friday night? Um, not sure. Probably just you know, went in for just before bed. Uh, so I probably left tweeted between eight and nine or so. Okay. Um, and you get to the base and spend the evening there and get up for the five thirty. Yeah. Okay. That's right. So we backtrack from there. Um, you when did you arrive at your home uh, at the cottage? Can That's clever, isn't it? That is very clever, and I've seen that technique done once before on a, on air. Lie to me. Yeah. Um, instead of asking someone to provide a linear narrative, e.g. where were you between 8pm um, and 6am, he's actually taking him backwards and asking him to do it backwards. It's harder to remember, isn't it? Yeah, especially if it's not true. Yeah, so that's brilliant technique by uh, Detective Smith there. I want to get confused between your home in Ottawa and the home yeah, in Tweed. So, uh, no, I had been in Tweed all week. Yeah. Uh, the week prior now. Um, yeah, I think that's the case. I was in Tweed all week. Flew Saturday, headed to Ottawa Saturday night. Okay. So, um, if you didn't have the stomach flu on the Friday, what was your schedule was that day? Eight, really. Okay. Um, what would have been my schedule? Just a standard schedule in the office. Okay. So, uh, office brief in the morning, a couple of, uh, couple of meetings. I can't remember what the specifics uh, were going to be. Okay, so um, Thursday night you slept at Tweed? Or you... Yep. All right. And what did you do Thursday during the day? Thursday during the day I was at the base again. Um, I think it was a fairly standard day. I can't recall exactly, but... Uh, yeah, nothing. I was not flying, so I was at the base. So I would have gone in early in the morning, back in the evening again. Okay. Do you remember what time you left the base that night? Mm, I don't remember anything peculiar, so I would say, uh, I don't know, probably seven to nine, somewhere in that range. Okay. And that's when you, you left? Left the base, yeah. And what, what it's a 45 minute transit. So 45 minutes home? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to walk you through November, but I'm going to take you to a date that's probably pretty fresh in your mind, uh, uh, the day that, uh, that Marie Franz uh, called yeah. um, Do you remember how you found out? I uh, do. Yeah, I was sent an email. Um, well, as soon as the, uh, the op staff and the base learned, they told me. Okay. So I got an email. I can't remember if it was late at night or early in the morning. It was certainly, I saw it. Uh, I want to say first thing in the morning because I had just come back from Ottawa. I was in Ottawa for um, um, a set of meetings on one of the days. I can't remember what, what day of the week we're talking about, but uh, yeah, no, I mean. Did you see what he did there? Yeah, I see exactly what he's trying to do. Yeah, tried tried to establish an alibi for himself, saying he was in Ottawa for a set of meetings that day. Uh, that would be easily checkable, but, you know, I'm sure he's worked, you know, his schedule around what actually happened. Obviously, when your people get killed, it uh, gets your attention. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I very much remember that coming in. And how did you know Marie Franz Coleman? I'd only met her once. Um, she was on a crew uh, I was on uh, just after I got to the base. Okay. So uh, I can't even remember. I think it was a one-day trip uh, I did a number of trips uh, in Canada transporting um, our um, you know, troops sort of first leg out of Edmonton. Uh, you know, we tend to hopscotch them across uh, until they get in the theater. So uh, anyway, I, I can't remember which trip it was, but uh, we did a number of them out to Edmonton just to, to pick up the troops, bring them to Trenton, and then uh, put a fresh crew on because uh, we'd fly out and back in the same day, so pushing the edge of that. And, uh, Fresh crew on, and then continue on after a couple hour delay. 
Okay. Do you know uh, roughly when that happened? That we were on the same crew? So you, the time you met her, the one time there, yeah? It was soon after I got to the base, so uh, I, I don't remember exactly, but I would say in the first couple of months, so August, September. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, you got that email notifying you that something had happened. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, any kind of a, a clear recollection as to how your schedule was going that week? Well, I can't remember what, again, what day that uh, the message came in. Just a second. Um, no, I can't remember what day, the day of the week, but I, um, I just think there was a whole bunch of activity uh, spun up as a result, obviously. No, I can't remember the day of the week. Um, I'm just trying to think through the news reports I read. No, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember what day that was, but... Uh, Once again, JCS mentioned this, so have to give them credit, but I think also Graham Coder did this in his interview with Chris Watson. I'm pretty sure that Esteban Flores did it with Jody. He waited. Did you notice? He didn't interrupt. He didn't say, that's okay. Don't worry about it. And moved on to the next thing. He just sat there and waited. He actually was staring at him just yeah. as Coda did and just as Flores did. Yeah. And I think it's a tactic in with um, detectives when they're questioning a suspect. Yes. It, it's a, it's a well-used tactic and it works. It does. It certainly worked on... Well, it definitely worked on Chris Watts. It worked on Russell Williams. Jodie Arias, as we know, was a tougher nut to crack, wasn't she? Or should we say a tougher marshmallow? What I what we learned after the fact was that the um, the MPs had learnt uh, of her death. I think quite a bit after her body had been discovered. Okay. So I think what happened. No, I'm sorry. Just a second. Okay. So I think. If I remember correctly, the MPs learned late that evening. I can't remember when, obviously, her, her body was discovered. It was probably in the news reports. But uh, so they learned, and then they passed it to ops. That they need, so they immediately passed it to me. Okay. The MPs work for the wing operations officer, so they go, you know, through their chain of command, and then as soon as the uh, the duty launch officer had that information, she advised me. Okay. Um, so again, that that along with, along week, with some others. Right, right. I'm sure it spread like wildfire. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so that particular week, uh, do you have any recollection? Well, for instance, when you got the email, uh, yeah. do you remember where you were? I was at home in Tweed. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you remember if that was a week that you were um, reasonably stable in Trenton, or had you flown? No, I had been in Ottawa. I had been in Ottawa early in the week uh, for some meetings over in, uh, in Gatineau for one of the... Um, actually for the C-17 acquisition. I was project director and when I was here in Ottawa for that, so just some follow-up stuff for that. Okay. So I had been here um, at some point in that week. Again, I can't remember how the days all fell together, but um, I seem to remember that I got this word shortly after having come back from Ottawa. It seems to me it was the same week. So if we were to uh, to you know do a, a similar uh, investigation in your background, is there is there anything you can think of that anybody may have misinterpreted or anything uh, in your history that somebody might say Russell Williams uh, absolutely did this? No. Okay. Be very boring. What's that? It'll be very boring. <laughs> All right, because essentially that's what I'm looking at. Is it? Uh, um, you seem like a very intelligent person, and I think you can see how um, a surprise like that would uh, certainly set off some alarm bells in an investigation, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so the next thing we need to cover off is, uh, well, I'll just ask you this straight out. Uh, given the types of crimes we're investigating, uh, do you get much chance to, uh, to watch television shows, CSI, things like that? I do watch uh, 
I prefer Law and Order, but I do watch CSI occasionally. Yes. Okay. So you have an idea of obviously the forensic capabilities, things like that, are out there. What would you be willing to give me today to help me um, move past you in this investigation? What uh, What do you need? Well, um, would you be willing to supply things like fingerprints, blood samples, sure. things like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, footwear impressions. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I think that's what we're going to we're going to ask you to do. Okay. All right. Now we have a process we have to go through to do that. Okay. Um, and for the blood sample, uh, I don't take the blood sample. We have specially trained officers that are trained to do that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to step out and make sure they're still available. Can I assume you're going to be discreet? It's possible. Yeah. Because uh, you know this would have a very significant impact on the base if they thought you thought I did this. Well, uh, bottom line, Russell, that's one of the reasons we're here on a Sunday afternoon. Okay. Um, uh, the uh, the military certainly be of great assistance for, to us, especially mm -hmm. in relation to Miss Como's investigation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's certainly one of the things that went into our decision to, to give you a call at home today and see if we could deal with this today. Okay. So, okay. Um, I honestly think that that is the first opportunity that he has had to think about the impact that his, well, certainly his being questioned would have on the base, never mind his being arrested and charged for this, for these, you know, murders and sexual assaults. I mean, I think, I honestly think that's the first time that's occurred to him that we see just there. Yeah, but also, shouldn't he be concerned about what he's going to be charged with and about the, his base? Well, yeah, but um, I think that's his first opportunity, and I'm not even sure that. He's even got to his wife yet. I don't even even think she's entered his head yet. No, probably not yet. Because it's tough to undo the rumor mill once it gets started. But I appreciate that. Okay. Now that you've had some time to... I mean, I know we've been throwing a lot of things at you here, but now you've had some time to, to think about things... Um, is there anything uh, that you're concerned about uh, that buckle swab matching in any of those four residences? Um, no. Is there, I guess, let me explain you when I'm getting down here, Russell, okay? Um, this is a significant investigation, as you can, yep, as you can well imagine. Yep. Um, that, uh, that DNA is going to be uh, significant in our investigation, both mm -hmm. uh, you know, quite possibly to help you, quite possibly to help us. Understood. I don't know yet. I don't know what the result is yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll go back to the example I gave you because it's a very similar uh, issue, I think. Um, and you talked about the idea of discretion here. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you talked about the idea that, uh, um, you know, you, well, I think hopefully you appreciate the fact of how we approached you here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and essentially, uh, we have no issues with that. Okay. Um, we, we talked recently about you know the whole idea of any unusual sex acts in your history, mm -hmm. um, but another thing that can often happen in cases like this is that people um, become concerned about uh, um, things like extramarital affairs, mm -hmm. uh, indiscretions along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, is there any contact that you may have had with any of those four women um, that you may not want your wife to be aware of? Anything like that that we should know about to try and uh, explain why, if if your DNA is found, it would help us understand why it may be there. Absolutely not. Okay. Can you think of any reason um, why we would find your DNA in any of those residences? Let's no. let's focus on. Well, for instance, uh, house, I believe. Let me just check the name there. Make sure I got the right address. I'm talking about the house that was just uh, a couple of doors down from you there in uh, in Tweed. A couple of doors down was yeah. Lori. I don't know her last name. I don't know. Mazzucati? I don't even know what her last name is, but uh, there's a, the, the woman down the road, three doors down, was, yep. her name is Lori. I don't know her last name. All right, let me just make sure we're on the same page here. Detective Staff Sergeant Smith knows her name very well. This is just to build tension you know, to kind of build, to kind of get a rise out of Williams to measure his nerves, I think. Of course the detective knows her name and he also knows what he's done. Yeah. 
Uh, but I think now Williams is getting nervous. Yeah. This is masterful, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, my understanding is she lived at 76 Cozy Cove. Yeah, so she would be the one, the second one. Uh, the second incident on your on your road there. Yeah. A couple of doors down. Ever been in her house? No. We met her once, I think the first summer um, we were there, so in 04. Okay. And that's what I'm getting at. I, I, again, this is a credibility issue, right? Yeah. Because I don't want to come and see you two weeks from now and say, you know, Russ, uh, yeah. our CSI people in that house. And uh, are you familiar with how C, uh, DNA works? I think broadly, yes. I okay. guess so. Um, one of the challenges we have in 2010 with DNA is it's become so um, precise that um, I guess the best way to explain it is I can think back to 15 years ago when I started in, uh, in violent crime investigation. Yeah. Um, for us to get a DNA match, the sample we had to find was, um, you know, probably would have filled half of one of these cups. Okay. You know, because they destroy so much of the, uh, the sample in the, in the testing. Okay. Um, essentially, DNA has become more and more precise to the point where when you and I walked in this room earlier today, mm -hmm. uh, we could have sat down, talked for 30 seconds, yeah. walked out. CSI officer could have come in three, four days from now, yeah. did some swabs here, and he would have found your DNA and my DNA, mm -hmm. and probably a lot of other people's DNA. Sure. Um, a little bit gross to think about, but essentially, uh, you know, as we talk, um, we, you know, a little bit of aspirate comes out of our mouth yeah, no, that uh, that contains our DNA, our blood, or uh, our skin cells contain our DNA, yeah. and that's what I'm getting at. If you were ever in Lori's residence, uh -huh. quite possibly, quite innocently, your DNA could be uh, in that residence. Has there ever been a time you've been in there? No. Okay. We're not sure how he was dressed when he committed the assault on Lori, are we? No, we're not. I mean, presumably he was dressed in, you know, some sort of disguise or, or some sort of mask. But it would be hard for him not to leave his DNA if he sexually assaulted her, wouldn't it? Well, yeah, you sexually assault someone, you're going to leave some sort of DNA around. Yeah. Hair, skin, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if he kept his mask on the whole time and she was, you know, unable to identify him, then... Maybe she might have recognised his voice unless he was trying to do like Christian Bale and Batman and trying to do a bad disguise of it, you know. He must have friends. <laughs> uh, but, you know, just occurs to me that it would be very hard for him to commit a sexual assault and not leave D DNA somewhere. Yes, they would have caught him eventually because of his d the DNA that he would have left. Yeah, yeah. Um, and not just on um, Laurie. And maybe not on Jane Doe, but definitely on Marie and definitely on Jessica. Um, what about the other lady down the road? On uh, I hadn't even heard that name, so no, I don't. I don't actually know who that was. Okay, have you ever vi visited uh, uh, Marie Franz Como at her residence? No. Okay. All right. Um, so you're quite positive there would be no reason why your DNA would be in any Absolutely. of those three locations. Okay. Um, did you know Jessica Lloyd even in passing for any reason? No, I didn't hear, hear her name until it was on the news. Okay. And the reason I'm asking that uh, is because um, I know you were asked that question on Thursday night and sometimes what we find, and again this is one of those situations that can sometimes cause us to get in a lengthy investigation as somebody that mm -hmm. maybe doesn't deserve it. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what can happen sometimes is they, you know, somebody gets stopped by the police like you did and they, uh, they get asked that question, and people, when they're stopped by the police, they can be nervous, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so they blurt out an answer, and then they start driving away, and they go, oh, why'd I do that? Because the problem is, is that once they uh, get asked again, then they feel compelled to maintain that answer for fear that if they change their answer, yeah. somebody could find it. You understand what I'm saying? I do. Okay. So I want to make sure that's not happening here. I don't care what you said to the officers on Thursday night no. last week. Um, if there's any uh, communication or contact between you and Jessica Lloyd, you've seen her picture, right, around yeah. town? Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Ever seen her before? I don't know. I would say I have not. Okay. All right. All right. And you mentioned something about uh, doing some renovations at your, uh, at your property in Tweed there. Um, I think you said something earlier about tearing up carpet, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Oh, yeah. Okay. When did all that happen? 
in 2004 or five. Okay. Any recent uh, renovations? No. Okay. All right. Trying to establish if he might have buried them at his property. I mean, we all know about what happened with John Wayne Gacy, don't we? Yeah, but then again, why else would the cop ask him that? Yeah, exactly. I'm sure I'm covering all the bases here. Um, what kind of tires do you have on your Pathfinder? I think um, I think they're Toyo. Okay. Do you know the brand name or sorry the uh, I think make? Is a, um, I don't. Know. Sorry, the, the make is Toyo. Yeah. I don't know the model. Okay. I'll read this off to you, see if it rings a bell. Ever heard of, uh, does Toyo Open Country HTS? That sounds Make any right. sense? Yeah. Okay. When did you have those tires put on your Pathfinder? Well, it's the second version we've had of them, so... Uh, I think it might have been this past fall. They replaced other ones we had on the same. Okay. Well, Toyo, I can't say that they were the same, exactly the same model, but uh, our dealership here in Ottawa says they're very popular for the Pathfinders. So okay. They were good. They lasted a long time. Is it darkening on him that they could have found his tire tracks? Or is he thinking somewhere along the lines of, well, why are they asking me that? Have they found them? Did I leave any at the crime scene? He may even be asking himself, why are they asking me about my tyres? What's that got to do with anything? Um, but yeah, I kind of think it's he's kind of figuring out that he's left something, some sort of tyre tracks, whether it's outside Jessica's or not, I'm not sure. I'm he, sure we'll find out. They were asking him about Laurie earlier on and about Jane Doe, whose name he didn't mention. So maybe, who knows what he was thinking, but maybe that he's starting to think, well, what have my tyres got to do with this, you know? Yeah, um, or did I leave any yeah, tire tracks did I leave there? Any tracks? Yeah, unknown really what he was thinking, but like we always say in our videos, it's always fun to speculate, isn't it? Oh yeah, I love it. I love it. All right, um, I've had to. Uh, I think you were talking about the the whole idea of the MPs uh, helping us with our investigation mm -hmm. stuff. I guess uh, you have the same system as we do at our headquarters with the swipe cards. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things uh, one of our investigators did is they made a call while I was talking to you there um, because we were trying to work through that week of the, uh, the 23rd of November. Okay. Um, 23rd being the Monday, uh, 24th being the Tuesday. Okay. Um, what, what, they've, what they've told us is that, um, and I want to make sure I get this right, is that uh, on the 23rd, uh, your swipe card was being used at the base, okay? Okay. Uh, on Tuesday, 24th, there was no use of your swipe card. Okay. okay, and then on the uh, the following days, uh, the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, um, there was what appeared to be average activity of your okay. swipe card in the base. Does that make sense to you? It does. That that says that I was in Ottawa on the Tuesday. Okay. Do you remember where uh, in Ottawa you were? Yeah, I was in Gatineau with, uh, as I said, meeting about the uh, C seventeen. Okay. Um, now, again, I want to be fair to you here. We're going back two months. Yeah. Um, are you sure that would have been the uh, the day you were in Ottawa? Well, only because I wasn't at the base. Okay. So I, I can't remember, honestly, that that's the day I had the meeting in Ottawa, but uh, if I wasn't at the base, it was because I was here. Okay. Now, if that is the day you had a meeting in Ottawa, um, do you remember being at the base on the Monday, uh, the 23rd, and swiping your card in and out? Do you remember what you would have done that evening to, to, to get to Ottawa for that meeting? Like, would it be... Uh, I drove to Ottawa in the morning of the day of my meeting, so if it was the Tuesday, then I would have left uh, Tweed. It was a very foggy morning okay. uh, that morning, and I drove in that morning. Okay. So I would not have been at the base uh, the day I was in Ottawa, because the meeting started at 8.30 or something. Okay, so you leave the base, you would have went home to, to your residence in Tweed? Yep. And then you left Tweed in the morning and drove up to your meeting in Ottawa? Yep. Okay. Um, you leave the, the meeting in Ottawa is a daytime meeting, evening meeting, or 
Do you remember? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was a, a daytime meeting, finished, I don't know, mid-afternoon or so. Okay. We had lunch and then uh, finished. I think uh, my wife and I had dinner because she was here for work and then I headed back. Okay. Um, well, that, that's these are the kind of things I'm trying to draw out here. That's helpful to us. Um, do you remember where you had dinner? <laughs> Uh, well, I don't remember exactly the restaurant, but it was in Westboro because that's where our house was being built at the time. So we had dinner, you know, in a restaurant that we would expect to be able to frequent uh, once the house was finished. Okay. Remember how you paid? Uh, one of us would have paid by MasterCard. Yeah. Okay. Are, are you sure about that? Or Pretty sure. That's normally how we, uh, okay. we pay for meals. All right. I can't remember if it was me or my wife that paid, but one of us. Okay. And do you remember which restaurant it was again? No. Okay. All right. And you see what I'm getting at, right? I mean, th that can be very helpful for us because yeah. if we can track yeah. uh, that issue, right? Uh, oh, yeah. We can we can put somebody paying for a, a meal at a, at a location. Well, I was card. meeting with uh, you know 15 people or so that day. So. Okay. And what time did the meeting end? Don't you think he's starting to get a bit agitated? Yeah, he is a little bit. I will admit, he, he, his demeanor does seem to be. Seems to be a bit rattled, doesn't he? He does, and I think he's starting to do I think that he's starting to think that they have me here. Yeah, but remember, um, Detective Staff Sergeant Smith did say it was going to be a thorough interview. Um, I think he's starting to feel the pressure, as you say. I would say between three and four. Okay. And um, are you sure that that's the same day you went out with your wife? Well, I think so, yeah, because she was here, and uh, I, I think that was the day we went to this restaurant in Westbury, yes. Okay. Um, you finished dinner, and do you remember what you did that evening? I would have driven back to Tweed. Okay. And you would have... Now, again, I, I know we're talking two months ago here, but do you yeah. remember specifically having dinner and then driving back to Tweed, or uh, do you remember... Uh, are you just guessing here? No, I'm not really guessing. I mean, I, I believe that this night at this restaurant was following the meetings in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, kissed my wife goodbye and headed back to Tweet okay. to go to work the next day. Okay. Um, all right. The, uh, the tires that you have on your truck, right? The reason I asked you about that is there, is there any time... I mean, uh, you recall uh, where you were stopped um, by the officers there? Yes. Okay. Did they explain to you what the significance so of that was? That was her house. That was her house. Yeah. Okay. So you remember that location? Yep. Yeah. Do you remember what the crossroad was? or? I don't think there was a crossroad. It's sort of just uh, on the south end of 37. Okay. Um, when you get stopped at that location, has there been a time in the recent uh, one or two weeks that uh, your vehicle has uh, left that road for any reason whatsoever. Have you driven into a field with your vehicle at all um, for any reason you can think of? No. Okay. Because um, I want you to rack your brain here. This is important. So yeah, yeah. is there anything you can remember doing that, uh, you know, would have caused you to, to uh, drive off the road no. at that section of roadway? No. That's my early, uh, that's the early part of the highway, and I'm um, just head north. It's about 30 minutes from there to... Uh, uh, probably 20 from there to my house. Okay. Once again, it's like this is an onion and um, Smith is peeling it back layer by layer because now Russell Williams knows why the ties are significant. And that's why that last answer he gave, he gave in a very low voice because I think now, as you said, he knows that they've got him. Yeah, and his confidence is dropping. It is dropping, yeah. So it's basically agitation followed by, oh shit, isn't e it really? Exactly. Um, would it surprise you to know that uh, when the CSI officers were uh, looking around uh, her property, uh, that they identified um, a set of tire tracks uh, to the north of her property, um, looks as if the vehicle left the road mm -hmm. and uh, drove along the north tree line of, of uh, Jessica Lloyd's property. Okay. Okay. Um, they took, uh, they, they examined those tire tracks mm -hmm. and uh, they ha have contacts in the tire business. Obviously, mm -hmm. tire tracks mm -hmm. are a, a major source of uh, evidence for us. Sure. Um, 
shortly after um, this investigation started, they identified those tires as the same uh, tires on your Pathfinder. Really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. One of the other uh, one of the other things that they do to try and identify the type of vehicle that may have left those tires, mm -hmm. well, is they do two things. They they talk to witnesses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there was a, uh, a female police officer that actually drove by that location uh, that evening mm -hmm. and recalls seeing an SUV type vehicle in the field up to the north of Jessica Lloyd's house, uh, consistent with a, a Pathfinder. Okay. okay. It may be consistent with other things, but consistent yeah. with a Pathfinder. Um, and they, uh, what they also do to try and identify the type of the vehicle is they look at uh, what they call the wheelbase width, mm -hmm. okay? Because different vehicles, different makes, models have wheelbase width. So yeah. they can take those two sets of tire tracks, measure the distance between them, yeah. okay? And determine what the uh, the width is, sure. and then they can enter that into a vehicle database and it will spit out the types of vehicles, yeah. okay? Um, your Pathfinder's uh, wheelbase width is very, very close to the width of the, uh, of the tires uh, that were left in that field, mm -hmm. okay? Um, do you have any recollection at all of being off that road? No, it's not off the road, no. Okay. All right. Russell, um, is there anything you can think of? Let's go talk about Marie France Como for a minute, okay? Mm -hmm. Is there any reason at all you can think of that during our investigation, obviously we're searching uh, computers, uh, uh, things like blackberries, right? Mm -hmm. Electronic devices, uh, looking through houses for things that are in handwriting, written notes, diaries, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not at liberty to tell you what the content was, but is there any reason at all you can think of why Marie France Como would have specifically referenced you in some of her, uh, in some of her writings? Not at all. No? I'm pretty sure um, Detective Staff Sergeant Smith is bluffing there. Are you? Yeah, I mean, he's got a... I think he's trying to worm something out of him. He, he probably knows he's guilty, but it's getting it out of him. Yeah, it's just that we couldn't find anything in our research, could we, about any you know diaries that she kept, certainly much less about anything that she wrote about him. So No, so... That's I'd probably a red herring, as you say, that she designed to kind of get a rise out of him. Yeah, or to see his reaction. Yeah, I mean, there's no evidence to suggest that, you know, he, you know, she was aware that he was stalking her or anything, is there? So... No, so there's... She didn't really write anything, so... Yeah, it's just basically a... I think it's just a bluff to, yeah, to kind is. of throw him off, isn't it? He's bluffing! No, absolutely not. Okay. Is there anything that she ever said to you that led you to believe that there might be something uh, more than a passing interest with her towards you? Not at all. No, we spent, you know, one flight together talking. I'd go back occasionally and talk. No, I... I'd, if that's the case, that's it. That's very surprising. Okay. All right. Um, you have any questions for me right now? No. Okay. Okay, so he's been in there just shy of three hours now. He came in at 3.03, .03 and it is now eight minutes to six in the evening. Okay, or in the late afternoon. He's been in there then nearly three hours. If he was innocent of this, or of this crime of Jessica's murder and of the sexual assaults, then wouldn't he have questions by now? Why am I still here? What evidence have you got? Why would he not be asking for his lawyer? Yeah, an innocent man would be. Yeah. I don't think um, a Detective Staff Sergeant Smith has actually hit him with any proper whammies yet. He's just been asking probing, searching questions, fact-finding questions. Yeah, I think it's more to uh, see his reaction than anything. Yeah, but these fact-finding questions are good because when he actually hits him with the whammies, he provides him with no way out. So let's keep watching. I'm just going to step out and see how things are going, okay? okay? I mean, it is a Sunday, but there's probably 60, 70 people working on this file, so there's a mm -hmm. lot of things happening. Sure. Uh, so let me go out and see what's happening, and then I'll, uh, I'll come back in and uh, we'll hopefully continue, okay? okay? I told you when I came in here uh, that I'm going to treat you with respect, and I've asked you to do the same for me. Um, we talked about the whole idea of how we've uh, 
uh, approach to here, okay? Uh, the, the trying to be as just read as possible, mm -hmm. okay? But the problem is, Russell, is every time I walk out of this room, there's another issue that comes up, okay? And it's not issues that point away from you, it's issues that point at you, okay? And I want I want you to see what I mean, mm -hmm. all right? This is the footwear impression of the person who approached the rear of Jessica Lloyd's house mm -hmm. on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January, yeah. okay? All right? Now, I want you to keep in mind that this is slightly smaller, okay, in scale, okay? Okay. All right? That's not to scale. That's The footwear is actually bigger. Okay. If you look here on the ruler, you'll see that uh, one inch is just slightly smaller than an actual inch, okay? okay? But this is the way it prints off on the computer. Yeah. I'm going to move this over so you can see what I mean, all right? Because essentially, when you're dealing with footwear impressions, um, we have a gentleman on the OPP who's uh, basically world-renowned. Uh, his name is John Norman. Mm -hmm. And essentially, with footwear impressions, uh, you're in a situation where you're, you're pretty much in the area of, uh, of fingerprints, mm -hmm. okay? And essentially, what we're talking about here is, especially when you start adding in other pieces of, of uh, information that mm -hmm. uh, support uh, an investigative position, Okay. Yeah. Well, now we know this is also another bluff. Yeah, it is. Um, JCS pointed it out, but there's no such thing as like a. It's not an exact science, to, you know, comparing footwear impressions, is it? No, it isn't. And you know, there's no such expert that like like a fingerprint analysis. There's no such equivalent for footwear. So, but then again, Russell Williams doesn't know that, does he? No, but he's going to think that. Yeah. This is a photocopy of the boot that uh, you took off your foot yeah. just a little while ago, okay? Yeah. Now, I'm not an expert in footwear impressions, so I rely on the experts. Footwear impressions are very much like, uh, like fingerprint comparisons, okay? You take a look at this print, and again, this is one print. This mm -hmm. person walked through, there's several different prints to compare, mm -hmm. so we're going to get features off of one print to compare, features off of another print to compare. Yeah. These are identical. Okay. Your vehicle drove up the side of Jessica Lloyd's house. Your boots walked to the back of Jessica Lloyd's house on the evening of the 28th and 29th of January. Okay. You want discretion. We need to have some honesty, okay? Because this is this is getting out of control really fast, Russell. Okay, really, really fast. Hmm. This is getting beyond my control. All right, I came in here a few hours ago and I called you the way I called you today because I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But you and I both know you were at Jessica Lloyd's house, and I need to know why. The way I see it, Williams has got three options available to him. One, deny everything. In which case he could say possibly that he'd been framed. Someone else was in his car. Someone else was wearing his boots. That's one option. The other option is to say, I'm not going to say anything until my lawyer gets here. And clam up until his lawyer gets there. And only talk when his lawyer is present. That's option two. Option three is just fold like a bloody accordion and admit it. Which is what he ends up doing, isn't it? Yeah, but have Spoilers. you noticed at the moment he hasn't protested his innocence? Not at all. Wouldn't an innocent man do that? An innocent man would say, this is ridiculous. What are you talking about? I wasn't anywhere near there. No, and you'd be, you'd be showing angry. some... Yeah, he yeah. hasn't even shown anything. No. So he, he's not playing 
you know, he's not playing the part of an innocent man. He's playing the part of someone who is desperately looking at these photocopies and playing for time, isn't he? Yeah, but he can't play for much time. No, he can't and he won't. 